Hey, what's going on, YouTubulous? EXO coming at you here, bright and early. Just finished up breakfast and popped a pimp on my forehead, and I'm not feeling good about it. Oh well, let's get the video over with with another classic EXO Q and A in full HD and color this time. Uh, someone asked why the hell the Q and A videos were in black and white. Well, it was kind of just for a little bit of nostalgia because way back in the day, we used to film all the Q&A videos at nighttime, and making the videos black and white can be a little bit easier on the eyes uh, at nighttime with that pixelated, hazy look. I feel so self-conscious over this thing, but oh well, it happens, man. I went a little bit too crazy on the forehead there. The first question is coming in from Drake Varian. Hey, EXO, can you explain RMS and what would happen if you give your subs lower wattage than the RMS? And would you recommend a battery isolator for a newer vehicle? Well there, Drake, I think I'm gonna focus mainly on the first portion for portion. Portion? I am wicked glad that you asked this question because there is a huge misconception going on right now that you can't power your subwoofers with less than rated wattage, and that is just totally untrue. And we're gonna walk through a quick little situation right now and explain why people would even begin to think that is true because it does have sort of a truth to it but it's mainly untrue and we're gonna go ahead and break down both of those situations right now you buy a 1000 watt amplifier and you buy a 2000 watt subwoofer you're driving down the road and you're listening to your bass and you just notice the subs not moving as much as you think it does it's got like 20 millimeters of x max and it's only moving this much and you're just like man you're disappointed. You feel that your amplifier should be pushing out more power to your subwoofer. So what do you do? You go up back to your 1000 watt amplifier, which is already properly tuned. Let's just say that for, for purposes of explanation. And you go and turn it up. The biggest mistake you can make. It's already properly tuned, and now you're taking your 1000 watt amplifier and overdriving it. Possibly even overdriving it by two, three, 400 watts of clippings, which is not good. It was a pure sine wave before, and now you're driving out 1300 watts of clipped bullshit signal. And what does that do? It creates heat. And what if you're driving for like 20, 30, 40 minutes, and you're still jamming clip signal? you're probably gonna have overheating issues. So that's why it can be a negative thing because obviously the subwoofer is gonna want more power in the first place, but don't worry, there is totally a way to do this properly. We're driving down the road and we notice that our subwoofer is not moving to its full potential. We don't do anything, you know why? because our subwoofer is 2,000 watts and our amplifier is 1,000 watts. All you have to do is look at the RMS of your amplifier and try to set everything up according to that. Don't look at the peak wattage. RMS stands for root mean squared. A lot of brands are gonna be advertising the max. You'll see 2,000, 3,000, but you wanna look at the RMS because that's what it will put out consistently all day long. So at the end of the day, the only really way you're gonna harm a subwoofer that's rated for higher wattage than what what the amplifier produces is if you're overdriving it, is if you're clipping the shit out of it. And even then, you still have a little bit more headroom depending on what the RMS of the amplifier is. And just to quickly touch base on your second question, I'm sorry if I went on a little long with the first one, uh, would I recommend a battery isolator for a newer car? Uh, to tell you the truth, I wouldn't recommend a battery isolator ever unless you're doing a higher voltage setup. The whole point of getting a new battery is to like supplement the other battery. So if you're gonna isolate it, and it's kind of a defeats the purpose of it, to me anyways, unless you have your, your engine off, all the damn time listening to your radio or running power tools on an inverter or something like that. That's the only time uh, you'd want to isolate it so you can have a nice safe startup, but I wouldn't I wouldn't isolate shit, my man. All right, next question is coming in with Steven Skeens. I think that's how you pronounce it. We're just going to link a little video for you here, Steven, because yesterday you are in luck. We answered everything that your uh, question has to offer here. Any words of wisdom for people, new people, uh, coming into the competition lanes? Check out this video I just posted yesterday, man. Really in-depth and pretty fun. Uh, just going through the competition, uh, you know, jamming some bass, doing some demos, and doing some pretty good numbers on the meter. So go ahead and check that out, Steven Skeens. Uh, there's lots of little great stuff in there for you to learn about competing in car audio. Okay, another great one here coming in from Delicious Cream Donuts. Oh, I could go for a delicious cream donut right now. I'll tell you that right now. 
Okay, what's your thoughts on loud bass and hearing loss? Well, I have a lot of fucking thoughts on that because I'm always getting comments, people saying that, oh, you're gonna go deaf in 10 years or 10 minutes and I can't believe you can still hear and this and that all about hearing loss. Well, what the frig's going on? Why do I still have such great hearing and why when I go to the doctors, I test 10 times better in like the 90 percentile of, of, of hearing? Well. Guys, there's a huge difference between going to a concert and hearing blaring music, vocals, speakers, than these low-tuned subwoofers. It's a whole different ball game. The only time I ever, ever, ever have my ears hurting is when I'm listening to vocals. Those huge PA setups, those Brazilian setups, the ones where you hear the, the words piercing through your ears. But when you listen to bass, the frequencies are so low that it translates as pressure. No longer really, ah, ow, ow. It's more of a visible air pressure and you can feel it much more than anything else. I mean, this is almost 155 decibels and I have no problem with it. It's because the, the notes, the frequencies, the music is so low, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be vibrating your eardrums so rapidly to create negative effects. I could rant on all day of, uh, about that because it's one of the hu huge comments that this kid's gonna go deaf, this kid's, this is so bad for you, this is a really bad sport, and all sorts of other that were being irresponsible to our bodies. But I don't really see it that way. I don't see it that way at all. So there you go, delicious cream donuts. I hope that little rant <laughs> was up to your, up the snuff for you. Uh, I could go on for days about that. All right, another great question here coming in with Kevin Robishaw. Um, this is gonna be kind of a mouthful, but I'm gonna go through it as quick as possible. Can you explain about the different box designs in the huge systems you show? I guess your Saturn is basically a, hu a large ported box, but some systems look like the car is part of the box, like a massive fourth order ported through the windows or something. And what the heck is Frankie? All right, well that's a great little question. Let's start off with sealed boxes. Really great for punchy bass. You could have a really small enclosure. A lot of people like the sealed boxes because it has a lot of cone control and you can play a lot of variety of music while having it sound very uh, even. It has a very slow roll off. Second, we have a ported box. A little bit steeper roll off, more output, a little bit bigger box volume. You're gonna need to have a, a, a port to be tuned uh, in relation to the volume of the box. All of that plays a huge effect in the final outcome. And a lot of people pick ported boxes because uh, you can get a little bit more air movement. And that's why I like them too. The next one here is a fourth order box. That is just a sealed box in a ported box. So you get the bo best of both worlds with cone control and output. You can do different ratios of fourth orders to increase your output on either end. And that's basically breaks down how you have um, the different frequencies working together. So you can hit the lows real good, you can sustain your nice low output, and have a nice high output too because you have two different resonances working together. And then going into the next one, uh, sixth orders, which is basically a ported box inside of a ported box, which is even a steeper of a roll off, a higher output, a little bit more peaky, and a little bit more picky as well. Harder to design, harder to tune, and it takes an even bigger um, volume. Well, Frankie's very strange because it's kind of a quasi sixth. It's really weird. It's technically a ported box. All the subwoofers are saying it's sharing the same chamber, but that one little notch out in the front technically is a chamber and technically is a variable into the whole tuning of the system, but it is a ported box with the port just set back a little bit with a chamber in front of it. But that's what Frankie is, technically just a ported box. All right, next question here, coming in with a quick one with Siren Vega Master T-Line Bass. Simple as this. Will you give me a shout out? Ah! Well, guess what, my man? You just got yourself a fucking shout out. EXO style. There you go, my man. I can't really... That's all, that's all she wrote, right? Next question. All right, next question here, which was kind of answered in yesterday's video. So if you already watched it, sorry, dude, but I'm going to answer it in this video anyways, because some people didn't watch it. He asked, uh, Ensyanix, Ensyanix, very cool screen name. How loud is my car on music? And how long do you listen to max volume? My loudest score to date is a 154.6, sealed up on the dash. 30 second average, I'm about 152 decibels. 
Um, for my music peak at 29 hertz, I'm about a 153.9. And uh, how long do I usually listen to that for? Not very long, 20 minutes driving from point A to point B, full tilt. And uh, if I'm going longer than that, I'll jam it for 20 minutes or so, turn it down, let them cool off do it all over again. So there we go, man. Short and simple for you, NCYX. Hope that did it well for you. All right, last question is from Michael Mella. And he says, EXO, are you ever gonna do a high to low frequency test in Frankenstein? Wait, in Frankenstein or your ion? Hey, that's a good question. I did it in the van. I didn't fucking do it in Frankenstein. But we can't do it right now, obviously, because we don't have any amplifiers. Still waiting in line there to get our crescendos. But in the ion, seems like a fucking good idea. I think we'll have to save that for the next video. What do you guys say? Slap a big fat EXO thumbs up for some bass and maybe some low frequency uh, uh, fl flexing in the next video and see how much, how low we can get in this thing, huh? What do you say? Well, this has gone on a little bit longer than I thought. It is fucking 8.35. We've been sitting here for quite a while, 35 minutes talking to you guys. All right, well, until the next video, this is EXO. Make sure to ask your questions in the comments below, and I'll try to pick the ones that pop out the most, and I'll keep on picking more ones from the thread. All right, talk to you in the next one. Ta-da!